I think hands down wood wins. Wood wins from the fact that it's renewable, it's recyclable, it's reusable, it's 100% solar powered. We believe it's one of the most responsible ways to use a scarce resource is to make sure that every single bit of it that you can goes to your final product. We think that veneer is one of the best ways to build a structural panel. It's very difficult to create a square product out of a round tree. You end up creating more waste just in the initial processing of that material. The way that we process the log or the block means that we're unrolling it kind of like a roll of toilet paper. I look at what we do as being one of the most environmentally beneficial outcomes that, that can happen, not only for the forests, for the ecosystems, for our water, and also for our rural communities. This is the Mass Timber Group Show. I'm Nick. And I'm Brady, and we talk to sustainable building experts. Today, we caught up with Tyler Freres, the Vice President of Sales with Freres Engineered Wood, a cutting edge producer of mass ply products. Their products perform better than other types of mass timber and have been used in world-class projects like the Nine Acre Portland International Airport and the 19-story multifamily building in Oakland, California. But before we jump in, if you want to learn more about building multifamily mass timber buildings and meet other teams doing the same, we're hosting the second annual Mass Timber Group Summit this August in Denver. We've got 30 plus sessions, three amazing networking parties, and building tours of the coolest projects in Denver, all designed to give you the tools you need to win more projects and level up your career. Check out the link in the show notes below for more info. And if you like these podcasts, subscribing to the channel is the biggest compliment you can give us. It helps us book incredible guests like Tyler and brings more mass timber awareness to the rest of the world. So with that, let's get into it. Oregon Business and Industry promoted the uh, the coolest thing made in Oregon award as a way to to promote these locally made products. Uh, and quite frankly, we went up against a fairly robust group of uh, businesses and industries out there that are significantly bigger than we are. Uh, and I think when the other thing that's that's interesting about it is that who would have thought that a wood product, which Oregon has been in producing for over 100 years, uh, could actually make the coolest thing in Oregon type of, type of uh, competition again. So what specifically they were uh, highlighting for us in our product is that uh, we make a mass ply panel, which is a CLT, cross limit timber equivalent panel. But instead of using lumber as a base material, we use veneer. So what you would typically, typically see in uh, plywood products each of those veneer sections are essentially included within, within our product. So um, the, uh, the project that I think was that really highlighted uh, our product for them was the Portland Airport roof. So the Portland Airport went on a complete renovation of the terminal core in which they uh, had the, the goals and the ambitions I think rightly to use locally made products in order to reconstruct what is essentially going to be a nine air, nine acre area of roof that will now house, um, you know, all the check-in and uh, departure and baggage claim areas within the Portland airport. So it's a pretty extraordinary project. We're very happy to be in, involved with it. Very proud that the Portland airport chose us to be one of the suppliers for it. Um, and it's going to really leave a mark on, uh, a noticeable mark on the organ, I think, for, for the quality of the airports. Just their, their decision to choose locally sourced forest to frame type of products for that, that, uh, that airport brought us to the, the forefront as creating a very unique product that, that frankly, they, they couldn't have done this type of roof without our product being in existence. Yeah, we're super excited to fly in to PDX and check everything out. And I know uh, we did a tour way back in the early stages, you know, last year and the year before when we went out to the International Mass Timber Conference in previous years. So we're super excited to kind of see like how those finishing touches are coming on. What put you guys in the mass ply area instead of doing what everybody else is doing with cross laminated timber and glue lam with traditional dimensional lumber? Like why did you guys take that veneer approach and why did you uh, decide to develop this mass ply product? Well, we have been a veneer manufacturer since the late 1950s. Uh, we produced lumber until then. And then uh, when plywood started becoming a uh, more of a 
usable product out there at the at, when uh, the vets came back from uh, World War II and were establishing homes. Um, it, it was a very good market for us to be in. Uh, so we've essentially been producing veneer for over 70 years. We've been producing plywood for over uh, 20 years at this point, almost 25 years. And so we've got a, a real history with producing engineered wood products. Um, veneer is, in a lot of ways, a superior way, way to build things because, uh, one, if you look at the raw material, a, a log or a block, you know, it's, it's very difficult to create a square product out of a round tree. You end up creating more waste just, just in the initial processing of that material. The way that we process the, the log or the block means that we're unrolling it kind of like a roll of toilet paper. Um, so what that specifically means is that while lumber facilities have a tough time getting above, say, 60, 65% of total fiber recovery to uh, end product like lumber, we end up getting about 80% to 85% of the log to the final product. Um, and don't get me wrong, nothing is ever wasted in the lumbering process or in creating veneer, but that other 15% usually goes to something like chips or other residual project products that need to go out as a different value stream. So from the number one base, yes, we believe it's one of the most responsible ways to use a, uh, a scarce resource out there is to make sure that every single bit of it that you can goes to your final product. Uh, after that, the veneer is much more easy to dry than, than lumber. So we typically get our veneer sheets down to three to 5% moisture content on average with, with the peak moisture content of 10%. Um, and then we segment that out into different grades of visual and density grade material. So you know, by the time that we laminate this up into a much larger and thicker billet, we know everything about that material. So for us, just from, com, coming from the understanding that we think that veneer is one of the best ways to build a structural panel, whether it's LVL, plywood, or mass timber, that was really what set us off on the road of trying to develop our own unique twist onto what cross lane material should be. Hey, we're going to get back to the podcast in just a second. But first, I have a question for you. Are you somebody looking to build a mass timber project? If the answer is yes, then you need to put together an experienced team. Our partners at Cornerstone Timber Frames are leaders in heavy timber construction and have 30 plus years of experience, which means you can trust them to get the job done right. They collaborate with Nordic Structures to bring you the highest quality FSC certified mass timber available. They also have some of the most advanced fabrication technology in the industry, so your project goes up smoothly without costly on-site modification or delays. That means they have the experience, network, and technology to make your next mass timber project a success. Learn more about Cornerstone Timber Frames by clicking the link in the show notes below. You've had some major projects, obviously, that's already been put in use case. Like we just talked about the Portland International Airport, nine acres of a roof system. You have the other project that you have just completed recently in Oakland, California, the 1510 Webster project. And I got to say, you know, but put this to rest if it is, but there's like wildly impressive numbers running around where it's like, you know, we uh, was, we were able to deliver that project 30% under what the comparable prices would be if they use traditional concrete or steel or, or, th or it would have been comparable to $30 million in savings. Have, have you, is that, are those accurate numbers to, to say out there? Yeah. I mean, they, oh, wow. Who was the primary developer on, on that project? Uh, they stand by those numbers and, and I really can't refute those numbers at all. Uh, you know, with the understanding that, that we are a wood supplier. So we have one very small portion to the overall building development, but I can say, you know, for us on that project, I was shocked at how well um, it was implemented and, and executed. We essentially started uh, making the panels at the end of May, uh, and we were completely shipped out for the 19 structure, 19 story structure uh, by the beginning of August. So their initial anticipation was that they would do a story every 10 days. By the time that, that we started delivering panels to them, um, and everyone got in the groove, they figured that, that uh, they needed to expedite the schedule and they would do a floor every five days. Now they think that on the next, next building that they do, that 
we will be able to deliver two floors a week in order for them to install that type of structure. So the speed of construction, while it's always been a little bit anecdotal in, uh, in the mass timber universe, I think it's really starting to get, pro get proven out on these projects that uh, other mass timber suppliers are, are able to execute on. So do you think that's where the bulk of the savings came from? Was the execution, the the length and time of the project was so sped up that it was that significant? Well, I, I guess, and, and just a two-part question to, real quick. I'm trying to get somebody to wrap their head around, including mine, the price differences of maybe an LVL versus cross-laminated timber. And, you know, on paper, is that is that a cheaper product? Or like... I'm trying to wrap my head around the the price differences. Yeah, well, I do. Let me try to address that in two parts. Uh, one for oh wow, and and their building, and then two just as far as what the what the general differences between an LVL product, LVL based product like what we have, and what uh, what lumber looks like. So uh, the the cost savings on a buildings tends to stack themselves tend to stack themselves over the life of the project. So whether or not it's the fact that you're able to do a, um, a thinner floor so you can increase your overall stories under the same height for code reasons, or if you've got a prefabricated exterior panel that just clips onto place and that you can start working on the interior portion to it, uh, I think there's, there's a lot of these opportunities that, oh, wow, I was able to specifically execute on that are very valuable um, that, that can really lead to the cost savings. On, on a material-to-material -material basis, as far as using concrete and steel versus wood, personally, I think we're very comparable now. Uh, I'm not an expert on, on concrete costs, but I think by the time that you start uh, moving up in a structure, that uh, the costs are going to increase significantly. One of the things that people are really working on very diligently right now is replacing those concrete cores with a wood solution. And that goes, goes uh, for two reasons. One um, is to the speed of construction, because one of the things that held us up on some of these projects is that we essentially have to wait on delivery until the concrete core goes up another one or two stories. So you're always waiting for the concrete to dry while the wood is already cured. So we do have clients out there that are working on um, substituting out the entire concrete core with an all wood solution. And I think that would really expedite the overall speed of construction for, for multi-story. Um, on a product uh, specific basis, you know, the uh, wood is always bought and sold on volume. And uh, so that means that we're competing with any sort of uh, local lumber producer for logs on the same you know, dollar per, per thousand board foot rate. So to the extent that you can handle that material and use it more efficiently, then absolutely your, your cross structure becomes a lot more stable. So um, just as a comparable, uh, so for Oh Wow, we were able to produce a um, five-inch thick panel that was able to span 12 feet across the width of the building, 11 feet, 10 inches, to be precise, um, and then get over a 16-foot span across the major force direction as well. In order to do that with a lumber-based product, you might need something closer to a 5 ply CLT or even potentially thicker. So that would mean seven inches of wood on your thickness of uh, floor plate as opposed to five inches. So right there, just by virtue of the fact that we can use a five-inch panel for the same application and actually increase your column spacing means that you've got significant savings on, on the wood panel itself. And so you talked about using that tree very efficiently in the processing stage, you know, where you're, you're capturing much more of that fiber that goes into that structural product. Uh, but that also kind of translates more into being more efficient with the forest resources that you're drawing on. So I heard somebody say once, like, if you got to cut a tree down, let's make sure it goes to its highest and best use. Right. And so for us, biasly, it's like going into a building that's going to last 100 plus years rather than turning it into, you know, wood chips to get burned or, or whatever. And so if I'm understanding this right, using the veneer process, you get more of that structural component out of the log itself, more of that goes into a product that lasts longer. And so that sustainability arc is also more, uh, is increased a little bit. Am I getting that right? Well, no, that's, that's absolutely uh, correct. In fact, you know, let me, let me take it even a step further on the front end in that 
So we produce veneer as a target uh, material in order to, to sell to our clients across the West Coast for LVL, for um, hardwood panels, for HDOs, MDOs, for concrete form, for marine grade panels, for whatever they want to produce out of our veneer. And then we use the portion that we want in order to make the products that we make on the laminated side. But on the front end, we produce uh, hog fuel, which is essentially bark. We produce chips, planer shavings, sawdust, and all those have a particular use and value in the overall marketplace. But the stuff that's um, that's more difficult to attract, attribute a value to, we have a cogeneration facility. So we're we're burning the wood waste that that uh, is generated by our facilities and turning it into a uh, into an electrical source for, for the Pacific. So, uh, you know, we typically produce about 7.2 megawatts of electricity uh, that goes all out onto the grid. That's enough to power about 5,000 homes in the local area. Uh, but what we really provide to the utility is a baseload energy, you know, stability to the grid in this, in this local area. And I think it's important to note, too, that we really only provide about 50% of the wood waste we need in order to operate that facility. The other 50% of wood waste that powers that facility is all urban wood from urban production sources that need some place to get rid of the wood residuals that they, they accumulate otherwise that wouldn't otherwise have any, any value that would be landfill. So being able to take that and generate it into a product that's you know electricity that everyone can consume and relieve what would other be otherwise be a landfill material is important. And, you know, amazingly enough, even the ash that's produced off the cogen facility is actually um, certified as bar biochar. So we are active in the biochar markets and the carbon credit markets in, in order to uh, to promote essentially the, the carbon sequestrating uh, capacities of wood products all the way down the entire production stream. Yeah, I think highlighting that kind of like holistic circularity of like when a tree comes out of the forest. It doesn't just get chopped up into a few two by fours and you throw the rest away. Like you guys have uses for all of the different components in, at these various different stages of manufacturing that go back and people use every day, whether they realize it or not. Like when somebody flicks on the light in their house in the community, part of that's powered by trees. So can you talk and address some of the misconceptions that are out there about the forest management practices and how they affect the environment and the communities and how uh, different regulations can then in turn affect what they're actually using every day? Yeah, that's a big question. So uh, I look at what we do as being one of the most environmentally beneficial um, outcomes that, that can happen, not only for the forest, but for the, for the ecosystems, for our water, and also for our rural communities. Um, what we provide the government is an opportunity to thin the forest landscape and create a more resilient forest in general. So what, what we have uh, essentially created in Oregon after essentially 30 years of, of uh, trying to reduce the amount of forest harvest and uh, mitigate you know, any sort of human interaction with the forest is a forest that is uh, unable to, is land that is unable to support the forest that, that is. I mean, Forests are a dy dynamic system. It's not as if we can put a bubble over a forest and it's going to stay the same forever without uh, human intervention. And what we've seen is that when, when the forest is unhealthy, then it is essentially mother nature will correct in one way or another. And generally in Oregon, you know, you're going to have forest fires in order to clear out what would otherwise be a large overgrowth of mortality. Uh, high levels of mortality across the federal forest landscape in particular. And so we would like to be the opportunity for uh, any of the landowners in Oregon, that includes the BLM, the Forest Service, the state, counties, anyone, to allow us to thin the forest landscape, to reduce the amount of dead trees that become the fuel for the next forest fire, and to allow our, our forest to be healthy and resilient. It sounds hard. You know, just, just how, how can this best be matched for helping out the future? Well, so we receive timber from a wide variety of sources out there um, from private landowners, and that could be small people that are uh, farmers that have a five acre plot to you know, private industrial owners that have 100,000 acres or the federal government that has you know 20 million acres of forest land. 
Uh, the source doesn't really bother us too much. It's just the, the fact that we need the supply in the first place. Um, so just to put this in perspective, you know, the, the Forest Service and the government and the state of Oregon recognizes that we have about 5.2 million acres of high risk fire severity uh, forest land in Oregon. Um, and that's that's a huge amount of acreage that needs to be treated in order to make it resilient and less less available to fire. Well, you know, a facility like ours that does widespread thinning of the smaller trees within an overall overall uh, forest stand, we might touch about ten thousand acres in a year. So, from that type of standpoint, we can be part of a solution, but only a part of a solution for a very large problem. And I think that's that's one thing that people have troubles understanding is how big this problem is and how far we've allowed the problem to extend by not managing our forest for the last 30 years and just the, the neglect we've shown our forest for the last 30 years. So we would just like it to become available. If the federal government or the state allowed the timber sale contracts to move forward as far as thinning larger portions of Oregon to create a healthier landscape, we're here, we're here to provide that type of service. Actually, If you were sitting across the table from somebody who had like the exact opposite opinion, like they're just dead set against forest thinning or touching these overgrown forests, how would you bridge that gap and help them understand that you're not slashing and burning it, that that will happen from the forest fire perspective that gets out of control. But like, how would you convey to them that, Hey, like what we're doing isn't uh, what you're thinking. Like we're here to help the forest. Like we, we depend on the longevity of these forests, like for the business, for the communities, for the jobs, for the everything that you use. Like we want them to be here in perpetuity. How would you convey that message? Boy, well, you know, I, I've been trying to uh, get input on how best to convey that message sometimes from, from most of the people I talk, talk to. But, you know, I, I think uh, just trying to give people a sense of perspective on what it takes to, to actually manage a piece of property. So, you know, our family has been in business uh, in Oregon since 1922. Uh, you know, we're fourth generation Oregonians. We're, I'm the third generation involved in this this business. Um, so we're on our 102nd year of operation. And this is with managing our timberlands over the last three generations as well. So it's the understanding of the longevity that's involved with the efficient and responsible management of land that no one no one is interested in destroying the environment. We all live on, on this earth. We all want to be part of it. Um, but you need to look at it as more like a garden. Uh, one thing that, that uh, I try, I, I'd like to equate forest management to something more like managing a garden as well. If you've had a garden and you picked up some seed packets, you see, you look on the back and you say, hey, you know, these seeds need to be need to be planted on hills that are six foot in spacing on a uh, on a 12, 12 foot 12 inch wide mound and then after it's it's sprouted and it's grown to a certain extent you need to thin those to a, uh, a certain level in order to make sure that you don't produce too many plants on one particular area in order to get the, the best outcome for your plant right that's gardening is kind of a, a passion of mine too so I love that the same goes for for forest land as well. There are some areas of, of California where we are currently growing 100 trees where one used to be. Uh, in Oregon, we have a lot of the same sort of mismatch, although it's a little bit more complicated with the complexity of, of our soil conditions, slope conditions, um, just the regional differences between the trees and the species. But we are definitely overgrown and overcrowded across the Oregon landscape. We need to thin those out. We need to leave more dominant trees there to be um, to grow bigger and to uh, be healthier in the long run. Uh, the other thing I, I tried to explain is, is how we manage our own land. So our target typically is that after a regenerative harvest, we will uh, replant and allow those trees to grow 40 years. And 40 years is a long time. And then we'll do a pre-commercial pre thin at around 40 years. That could be 30 to 40, depending upon the soil conditions or the site class. Um, we won't touch that land again until 60 to 80 years for another regenerative harvest. So you're talking about a huge amount of time from initial planting to, you know, the next harvest in order to, uh, well, in order to, to get the revenue off that, pro that property, 
but also to create more of a healthy forest. What we typically see after pre-commercial thin at 40 years, we, we try to target 50 to 60% thinning across that, that, uh, that forest area. So you can look at it as, as if you're taking 50 to 60% of the volume or trees off of a particular stand. 100% of the volume that we've taken off at 40 years is back within 60 years. So what you have are healthy trees that are able to grow for those additional 20 years, as opposed to stunted trees that are fighting with their neighbors for the limited resources. Yeah. So you very, thank you for that answer. You've addressed kind of like what we're doing in the forest, why it's beneficial. And, you know, we're here to help. We're not here to just come in and, and wipe the forest out. Like we want these things to be here forever. And not only are we coming in there and helping to solve these, the problems that are in the forest with the overcrowding and the lack of uh, management. We're then turning those product, those trees back into products that are helping uh, the different social uh, problems that we might face. Like one of them being, you know, carbon in the, the built environment, like the construction industry is probably one of the, the biggest emitters out there, specifically in the concrete and steel space, which is what we're trying to replace with these different mass timber products. Uh, what other typologies? We've talked about the Portland airport. We've talked about these big high rise buildings like down in Oakland, California, are there other use cases for mass ply that people might not be thinking about? Yeah. So we've done all, all types of different uh, buildings and, and structures, but uh, you know, modular build, whether a flat pack modular or volumetric modular, you know, volumetric being it's fully constructed, travels down the, the road as a completed structure. We've done both of those. And uh, you know, we try to stay agnostic as far as what the overall end use is. Um, if people are able to come up with their own fantastic solutions with our product to create these types of structures, we're just happy to, to uh, supply the product. And we've done single family homes, quite a few of them actually, if there's uh, particular um, uses and reasons why they need a, more of a mass timber solution. And that could be heavy snow load. It could be a short building season. Uh, Jacksonville, Wyoming, or even Park Cities, Utah. You know, those types of areas in which a prefabrication or a pre, uh, pre-engineered panel will, will uh, be better for them. That's been a great use for us. Um, we have been working with a uh, timber builder down in Austin, Texas, uh, regarding a mass ply light sort of arrangement in which um, it's still our material, essentially LVL-based, uh, veneer-based products, um, but they're using it on more of a post and beam sort of construction. So instead of doing more of a two by four or two by six on a, on a 16 inch stud or 12 inch spacing, they're doing uh, something closer to a eight foot span on the post and beam. That has a lot of promise as well. And we're just looking for the opportunities to put our product into all building types. Uh, one of the true blessings about mass timber, I think, is that it has highlighted um, wood as a potential construction material for buildings that, that it hasn't been considered before. We've always had this limitation that we cannot put uh, wood products into buildings that are taller than, say, four stories, maybe on a pedestal. Um, but now we can start designing buildings that are uh, 12 stories, 18 stories, 20 stories, 24 stories. I mean, really, the sky's the limit, depending on the engineer. And people are able to make their, their own judgment call at this period of, period of time about whether or not Wood is a more environmentally sustainable uh, building material than steel, or wood is a more environmentally sustainable building material than concrete. Uh, I'm, of course, very biased. I, I think, hands down, wood wins. It, uh, it wood wins from the fact that it's, it's uh, renewable, it's recyclable, it's reusable, it's 100% solar powered. So you've got a, and it, and it grows back very, very well under managed condition. So from that standpoint, it's not a strip mine. It's not, you know, a, a hole dug in the earth. You've got a forest that's there for generations in order to provide these types of buildings. So I think hands down from the sustainable, sustainability standpoint, wood is good. What the, the hurdle is, is um, people being so stuck in their ways that they won't consider other types of construction methods for these types of buildings and the risk being too great. I got to say, you glossed over that pretty quickly. I don't know if you're just trying to be humble, which, you know, it's I, I know you're a humble guy, but what's got me most excited about, maybe I'm just completely wrong, is that that light frame system that you're coming out with that, you know, that's going out onto the Dripping Springs 
Texas project. And the only reason I think it's got me so excited is because, you know, I'm a, a regular, regular old guy, I guess you could say kind of middle of the road where I'm not developing high rises or these massive projects. And I don't know how many of those people in the country are, but I just know the difference of the amount of people that can build a single family home. And if, and finally, there's now a way to build it sustainably with your light frame um, system. And so it just feels like that the, the piece of the pie is one 10,000 X out there, just the amount of people that can build their single family home versus, you know, these, these people building 19 story projects like you, you did with, oh, wow. Uh, you know, am I wrong? Or do you, uh, do you kind of see that as like a wild card where you're like, gosh, we don't know how big this is going to be. Or are you, I, I don't, what do you guys think? I, I think you actually put it very, very well there. I think, you know, if I, if I'm reluctant at all, it's because over the last few years, we've been cons consistently told that mass timber is completely un in, not cost effective when looking at single family homes or not accessible from that sort of standpoint, that the only place that we should be looking are larger structures, aesthetic structures, or multifamily structures. And I, I think if, if they are really able to prove that type of construction method down in, in Austin and show that it's quick, it's cost effective against light wood frame, I mean, that's a heck of a feather in the cap. I just, uh, you know, I really want to see the finished structure and see it done. But so far, it seems like it's a really positive uh, uh, project so far. So I'm looking forward to seeing it. Because I, I believe the wood showed up on the job site. I'm watching it closely. If you can't tell, I'm excited with, uh, about that project. But I'm pretty sure that wood delivered even just a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. We delivered at the uh, the beginning of uh, well, the second week of February on, on most of that material. Cool. It, so so I understand waiting. Makes this, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, one, one of the things that makes this a little bit unique when it comes to a mass timber product is that we're somewhat agnostic as far as the overall thickness. We can we are fully certified to use a one inch to inch and a half panel on a four foot wide basis um, at whatever length you want to use it at. We can do a two inch thick panel up to 12 feet wide at 48 feet long. So, you know, when people start comparing wall segments or, or spans to the thickness of panel, that's, that's where things just really start to get a little bit uh, not cost effective. Well, since we can create such thin elements that still qualify as a mass timber, you know, that's what opens the door to people thinking creatively to go back to a post and beam construction and really minimize the number of pieces, but also increase the quality of the structure overall. So I, I think that's what they're really trying to do at, at the, the Mass Timber Light Timber Builder. And I think it's a, it's a real admirable uh, uh, attempt on this one. I think, I think they're going to be very successful. Yeah, we're, as you can tell, Nick is very excited to see that one get done. And so are we. And we're going to talk to Trent um, here in April and kind of get an update on how that project's going. And so we'll see if that, that proof is in the pudding, like you were talking about. But one thing we talked to um, Scott and Molly Cutler with Cutler Development uh, a few weeks back, and you guys actually have proof in the pudding where you use some of your mass fly panels to go into affordable housing project, which, I mean, same kind of conversation a few years ago. That's like mass timber is just pure premium. You're not going to be able to put it in, you know, these smaller or more cost conscious type projects. But you guys have been done an affordable housing project. Is that right? That's correct. We've actually done uh, quite a few of them that qualify as affordable housing or low income housing developments. And uh, yeah, I, I think that would will that would in this this sort of format will really prove itself out to be a very cost effective way to build and, and can really hit the lower dollar price point per square foot that people are looking for. The one thing I just keep like adding is that our largest cost for our facilities is the raw material. By consistently reducing the supply of timber in Oregon, it makes all of our housing materials more expensive. It's more expensive to produce the lumber. It's more expensive to produce the plywood. It's more expensive to produce our mass supply panels. If they made the supply available, if they allowed us to, to manage these forests and, and provide enough supply that the price would come down, we, we would see a significantly lower cost of material for these. and we will hand, hands down be concrete and steel every single day for this type of structure. 
yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that kind of environment plays out over the next few months or the next couple of years. Uh, what are you guys after next? Are you guys have big projects on the horizon? Are you doing something similar to PDX? Are you guys taking the company in a certain way? Like, what are you guys after? Yeah, well, so we're, we're doing a bunch of things, in fact. So what, what we recognize is that um, from our log basket, what we have available, there's material that's appropriate for mass timber. There's a, Material that's appropriate for LVL, and there's material that's appropriate for fiber. It's the standard commodity. So we're making a big push this next year on creating efficient operations so that we can utilize the entire 100% portion of the, the, the near wood basket that's produced from the logs. So we're looking at uh, some fairly dramatic investments in new equipment and processing in order to automate the process and make the uh, the engineer wood products manufacturing a lot more attractive to people. Um, it's very difficult for us to, to find consistent employment here at the back end of a dead end canyon in the San Diego Canyon. Um, very difficult for us to get people. So we're trying to make the jobs easier, attractive, and uh, especially to the local people. A very cool project we're starting in the next uh, month or two is uh, a building that's going on our own site, which is gonna, going to be a uh, 65,000 square foot plywood warehouse. Uh, it's going to be all wood. We're making uh, all structural elements out, out of our own product. Um, the columns are on a 40-foot spacing. Uh, we don't need huge spans on this, just due to the fact that we're storing plywood in it for the most part. But, uh, you know, we have had uh, designs where we can end up with 100 or 120-foot uh, clear span for this type of structure. So this is the one that we settled on. We should be starting the uh, construction of that next month or two, and uh, we anticipate having it finished by midsummer. That's unbelievable. What did you say that you you configured that warehouse to have 120 foot clear spans? Yes. Oh, that's impressive. That'll that'll be cool to see. And obviously, it's 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 on site, so it's you know you can you can do tours and and that type of thing as well. Yeah, you know, we think this is going to be very representative for what people are looking at for a warehouse space using timber. It's also a pretty good example of how you can replace concrete tilt-ups with uh, pre-finished uh, wood panels. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about data centers and, and tech uh, headquarters out there. I mean, that type of square footage that you can put down in, in a very quick, very expedient period of time is, is uh, pretty attractive. So. We need the space. Most of our buildings are 70 to 80 years old. Um, so we've kind of run the lifespan of a lot of structures around here. So we decided we might as well lead with our own ethics here and put up a fantastic building. And to be clear, the, the 120 foot clear span was, was a concept. It's doable, but we decided to go for a 40 foot column spacing on, on this building. In particular. And just to make sure I'm on the right page, you said for warehousing, was that all internal for yourself? Or are you going to use it for like a reload? And, you know, people can come in with a, is it on like a spur or some tracks or something? We are on a spur and we are on tracks. Yeah. So I would call this more of a market evolution um, in that what we see in the marketplace for, for our, uh, typical commodity products nowadays is that uh, people are pushing the inventory back onto the producer. So there's very little interest at high interest rates in order to hold onto inventory in the yard. So we see wild swings in the marketplace when people overbuy, then underbuy. And so everyone's just trying to run their inventories just in time. So they're not, not having additional expense. That is disastrous for a producer. We are used to producing a certain amount of material on a day-to-day -day basis. We're not used to having sudden surges of, of production capacity to try and try and move with markets on, on, on a daily basis. So in other words, if you have three weeks of slack market and suddenly we're st stuck to the gills, our only option is to shut down. So people would look at it and say, well, hey, you know, the, t the timber companies are doing a, a shutdown again to try and get the prices up. That's not the way it works. I mean, what we want is steady, consistent production with steady, consistent employment. So we try our best to make sure that we've got consistent production schedules to meet the market conditions. But if the market conditions aren't there, we are left with very little opportunity beyond shutting the facilities down before you stuff yourself full of inventory. So our, our, our goal is to double or triple the amount of inventory that we can store so we can have those consistent runs. It's new sort of potential. That's smart. Well, as we wrap up this conversation, I wanted to pivot just a little bit because 
you're you've said this a uh, uh, multiple times and it's a much different business model than maybe other mass timber producers where you know they have a whole maybe engineering team or design team and and it's a turnkey where if you come to us you know we'll produce it we'll truck it out there we'll install it and then you know it, it's a full turnkey system but it sounds like you said where you really you really hands off on what the ultimate end user is going i mean Obviously, you have to work with the size of panels. There's a much different size of panel from the 1510, you know, Webster building in Oakland compared to, you know, the, the, the Portland International Airport. And my question to you is, what type of person do you like to talk to? Is it that engineer or is it the builder or GC? When does a person come to you with their idea to get it done? Wait, I think it's one of the feelings with, with building is so there's just not enough trust involved with people that they can start going down the road with the initial architect, engineer, mass timber supplier, and the GC all holding hands and saying that we can make this project work over the design period of two to three years. Um, that you know, typically what happens is you have an architect and an engineer that are working with you to implement your product on a development, and then you could be providing costing through the entire period of that. But then they go out to a GC on a low bid basis, or they maybe they got a preferred GC that they haven't actually had involved in the conversation so far. Well, I recognize it takes a ton of trust from people to, to think that we're not going to escalate the price costs on them at the end of the project after they've spent so much time with us. So we've really prided ourselves in the fact that we've, we've maintained almost every quote that we put out there and, and not had an escalation. Uh, on a volume basis for it, unless the project changed consider considerably. So I would say the conversation is different on, on each portion of the uh, the conversation, depending on who you're talking to, but they're all pretty enjoyable because they all come in into the uh, into the project with a different perspective and from a different angle. So it, it's it's always pretty fun to, to see new people talk about these types of problems. Yeah, absolutely. So before we ask our last question, where can people connect with you and Freos? So uh, we try to keep our website, website very well updated. So uh, freriswood.com. Uh, we also have contact information as far as phone numbers and whatnot, emails for, for appropriate departments. That's the best place to go to. We also, of course, have presence on, on YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So you can find us at any of those locations. Yeah, we'll link all those down below in the show notes for anybody that's curious about checking them out. I mean, you, you said it, your website is very up to date. You've got your projects listed, great photos, write ups on all of them. So I encourage everybody to check them out. Um, last question. If you had the power to change anything about your industry, what would you change and why? It, it's, it's really this understanding of the forest, forest management, and the beneficial cycle of putting wood products in buildings. That people need to understand the origin of their materials that they use as consumers, and they need to know where it comes from. It cannot be environmentally sustainable to ship our, project, our products all across uh, the world in order to use them here. Well, we should use our products locally and sustainably locally. We should think on a forest to frame mentality, just like we think about a, uh, a farm to table mentality for our food. It's better for us to manage our resources here locally instead of uh, buying a bunch of material. That's a great point. Nope, it makes a lot of sense. Well. Gosh, man, thank you for coming on the interview. We learned a ton. We're excited to see you next, uh, well, it's, it's already March. We're excited to see you in a couple of weeks in Portland for the International Mass Timber Conference. And then we get to um, uh, see you again in Denver for the Mass Timber Group Summit coming up in July 31st, August 1st and 2nd. So we're really proud to have Freras as a sponsor and they can talk much, much deeper to you there at, the, well, at, at either event. And I'm looking forward to it. And thank you guys for putting that on.